thank you. Um, yeah, I'm the state plant pathologist with the Department of Agriculture, and we. Um, and I've been there for about three years. And before that, I worked with extension um, for Washington State University for about three years, um, doing research and outreach on the sudden oak death pathogen. So the, just the, a little bit about my background. Um, so last fall um, in Virginia, we had we detected boxwood blight and since then we've been dealing with one main site that had it and doing some trace forward work and today I just want to give you some background on the disease bear with me when we go through that but I I think it's useful and then we'll talk about skills for recognizing it scouting for it in the field and strategies to um, exclude the disease and then strategies to actually kind of mitigate the effects if you ever do have an introduction of it. So we'll start out with some background real in general about cylindrocladium species. Um, cylindrocladium species are well-known nursery pathogens, um, especially in container or small seedlings under heavy irrigation or overhead water. Um, they're called cylindrocladium, cylind they have cylindrical spores, um, they produce vesicles that really are how they're identified by. That's how the different species are described and um, given their different names or at least identified a lot of the times. Um, <clears throat> They produce these um, chlamydospores, and which are resting spores, which all combine together to create microsclerotia. And this happens in plant tissue. So infected plant tissue often will fall to the ground filled with these microsclerotia, and those can stick around in the soil for as many as 15 years. So it's a troublesome group of soil-borne pathogens. A lot of soil-borne pathogens do this, like verticillium or fusarium. So that's nothing really different either. So pathogens in ornamental plant pathology, agricultural crops, for example, peanuts in Virginia, North Carolina. Um, there have been issues historically with cylindrocladium in production fields. Um, <clears throat> forestry, in many um, seedling production, I've seen quite a bit of literature on um, pines and root rot of pines. So they cause root rots, especially well known for root rots, um, cutting, cutting rot, and I'll, I'll go back for a minute, ornamentals, azalea has been the classical thing since the 1970s. There was a huge issue with um, cylindrocladium um, leaf and shoot blight, especially with cuttings. Um, rooting in the while you're rooting cuttings having issues with that um, so we've got root rots um, cutting rot leaf spots they can form cankers basically areas of dead tissue is what a canker is um, and shoot blight where you get dieback um, from an infection um, <clears throat> in general they they favor um, more temperate to tropical regions they like warmer weathers and that's a generalization but typically they they like warmer conditions more more um okay so root rots different types of symptoms caused by different species of cylindrocladium on different hosts um, I don't know if I mentioned, oh yeah, there's like 52 species of these things. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly large group of organisms. And then um, this on eucalyptus in Australia and forest situations, it's been a big issue for a while too. I think they get established in the nurseries there and then when they outplant them, they get, they see this stuff for decades afterwards showing up here and there or after they first plant them, so. <laughs> So boxwood blight, let's talk about this boxwood blight disease. Where did it come from? What's going on here? Um, so in 1994, a sample of boxwood came in to the, Hoyle, the <laughs> Royal Horticultural Society. They have basically like a plant clinic, uh, but it's part of the Royal Horticultural Society. And it, um, the scientist or the diagnostician there um, said, oh, it's a cylindrocladium. 
and um, so she identified it as a really common cylindrocladium species. They all look alike. You really have to be an expert in this group of pathogens to tell one from the other. So she, she, it's probably this common thing. It was causing some defoliation. So four years later, there was a second outbreak, and as I understand it, it was a larger outbreak um, in the UK. She received more samples. <clears throat> And then she said, well, this is a little fishy. I mean, why, do, why, do, why is this showing up again, um, you know, twice in the past several years? And then there was this expert who just lives and breathes cylindrocladium and cylindrocladium-like species. This is what he does. He's been studying them for, for decades and decades. Um, he's been studying cylindrocladium species, um, and he saw this looked at it, looked at the, got it in culture, looked at the vesicles, recognized it as a new species. And around at the same time, the, the scientists in the United Kingdom realized it was a new species, so then they were in a race to name it and become the first to have described this new species. So they did publish it right around the same year, um, in 2002, <coughs> and you know, Stuff happened between 1998, but eventually, close to 2002, they realized they had a new species, so they're trying to publish this thing and be the first to describe it. So Kraus, Pedro Kraus, and Patrice Hendricott both um, described this. It's the same thing, cylindrocladium pseudonaviculatum which describes actually the shape of the vesicles, pseudo, kind of like naviculatum, the shape of a ship. So the vesicles have a shape, you know, they look like the front of a ship basically. Um, <clears throat> and Hendricott named it after the host, um, Buxicola. Anyway, Krauss's was published just a little bit ahead, so his name is the proper name to go by. Just a little background on that. You'll see both names in the literature. Pseudonaviculatum is what you're supposed to go by. Um, <clears throat> but you'll see it as both, and Buxicola is kind of easier to say, so that'll probably stick around for a while. <laughs> um, so box blight. Nin since 1990, since th this new species has been described um, not too long ago, 2002, it's been pretty much confirmed in outbreaks all th um, and in the landscape and in nursery situations all throughout Europe and in New Zealand. Um, and that was up to uh, last fall. <clears throat> Likely what has happened is it's being spread through plant material. It probably was somehow established at some nurseries. My understanding from what I have heard is that the industry, boxwood industry in Europe, they have large producers who s ship the stuff everywhere. It's not like here where we have hundreds of s relatively smaller, I mean they're large operations, but we have many several or maybe a hundred or a few hundred decently sized growers of boxwoods. There they have, you know, maybe you can count them on your fingers that are shipping many, many plants. So if it gets in a few nurseries, it'll get all over the place really fast. So that's basically what the theory is. It's spread throughout nursery stock quite fast in Europe. <clears throat> Now, in here in the States, or in North America rather, <clears throat> we had um, the first find was Kelly Ivers at the University of North Carolina um, the, was the first to um, identify this with the help of their plant clinic there. And they um, found, um, they observed massive and fast defoliation and decline on containerized boxwoods. Um, the grower there, you know, saying, you know, we have this decline, um, and they were communicating with the plant clinic. Finally, a sample was brought in, and it was a couple month period at least until they figured out what they had. Um, so, <clears throat> It was reported um, <coughs> USDA were t was told about the sample, they confirmed it, and then North Carolina told us that, um, <coughs> and Connecticut found it shortly after, um, but North Carolina told us that well, this was right on the border in North Carolina to Virginia, um, Carroll County, Virginia, right there on the border. They told us, look, this 
nursery that had plants brought them have some fields in our state too so we that's how we became involved with it um, so basically after that happened fo folks started looking around they're doing trace forwards and trace backs <coughs> and we have at, currently there's 10 states I don't I think Ohio's not listed on here in two um, providences British Columbia and Ontario that have the boxwood blight confirmed. Um, some states, on most situations, it's in the nursery. In Connecticut, and we'll look at some pictures, it really um, established itself in some landscape situations and spread um, what appears to be very rapidly, which is concerning because you think in a nursery situation, you have humidity, you're maybe, you know, it's under plastic when it really gets established and goes crazy, and then you would hope that on, when you got it out of those conditions, it wouldn't spread quite so bad. But we'll look at some pictures from Connecticut, and that's, that's really what is concerning. Um, Cylindrocladium pseudonaviculatum, the boxwood blight pathogen. We'll talk about its host range, what the signs and the symptoms look like to help <laughs> develop some skills for, for doing uh, um, <clears throat> some scouting. And then we'll talk about management guidelines for excluding it and then for dealing with it if it becomes inadvertently introduced and it sticks around for a while. Um, so you'll have reducing your um, impacts. The natural host range in Europe, um, Buxus sempervirens, many different cultivars of that, the microphylla and the um, Sinica. Um, all of these very um, well-used cultivars, microphylla is becoming more and more popular. Um, Semperverence has the American and the English boxwood and the American within that, that group, that species. So I guess the Cefruticosa would be the English. Um, boxwood, I believe, and everything else would be a variation of American boxwood, I think. <coughs> it's, boxwoods are a whole, there's a, um, there's a lot into boxwoods and hybrids and it's a, it's a science in itself. Um, experimental host range, in Europe they conducted inoculation trials to see what in the boxwood group could be infected. So within the boxwood family, they aren't in the, they don't have the same genus as Buxus, but we have things like, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but Sarcococca, or Sarcococca, um, and not listed here, but they didn't do this in this inoculation trial, but um, <clears throat> Pachysandra is in the boxwood family, but mostly we just have a bunch of boxwood um, species and sarcococca. So they basically found that all of these were susceptible. Um, here, if you're looking at the top of this, these are the less susceptible um, species of boxwood. So down at the bottom, the Insularis um, species, in, um, Seneca um, variety Insularis, um, English, Amer and American, and these microphylla species, they're all quite susceptible. When you get up um, Sarcococca, not so much, but it still is a host. They can infect it quite readily. All of these were also found to be infected in the landscape as well. Now in Connecticut, the only thing we had in um, Virginia and in North Carolina for the most part the American boxwood, because that's what they were growing and that's what ended up being planted out in the field. In Connecticut, where they've had more um, finds and stuff, they have a larger host range. So the take, we'll go through these, but the take home message is boxwoods are pretty much all susceptible to this. There may be slight differences in susceptibility, but they'll all act as hosts and they all can be defoliated <coughs> quite readily by it from what we've seen so far. So again, common boxwood, the English and American varieties, different species of the little leaf boxwood, Buxus microphylla, um, more Buxus microphylla, and Seneca, the um, variety in Solaris. All have been found positive in Connecticut in landscape and nursery situations. And then these are more of the 
um, Insularis hybrids with the uh, Semper Virens. You know, Green Mountain, I see that a lot. Green Velvet, Green Gem. These are all really popular right now. So in Connecticut, someone at the Connecticut um, Agricultural Research Station, they conducted some inoculations on Pachysandra, which is in the boxwood family, and they found that they could infect it. Um, it was under fairly high levels of spores. Um, this has never been found to happen in the natural in a natural nursery situation, just under um, lab in the lab, exposing the plant to high inoculum levels. But it can act as a host. Um, this is a uh, infected Pachysandra with um, some sporulation of the um, boxwood blight pathogen. Just really briefly, out of general interest, um, the boxwood family has the genus Buxus, Pachysandra, Sarcococca, or Sarcococca, whichever you say, and Styloceris. Um, Pachysandra is this right here. We just have Pachysandra here in the eastern United States that's actually native. Um, if you look at the global worldwide distribution, some of the hot spots of the great diversity are in Southeast Asia um, and in Cuba. And the Caribbean, for example, has Cuba has 14 native species alone of boxwood. So there's high diversities in some of these areas. And I'm just bringing that up because sometimes the center of origin or where you have high levels of, of diversity of a species, sometimes that's where the pathogen will come from. So I'm not saying the pathogen came from one of those areas, but for example, the late blight, the potato, the uh, Phytophthora infestans came from the Andes Mountains, which is where the center of origin of potatoes is, where there's a lot of diversity of it. Just a general fun thought, and I just find it fascinating. I had no idea that boxwood diversity was so high in these regions. Okay, so this is what we saw um, at our Virginia sites. One gallon pots of the American boxwood, heavy levels of defoliation. Now, from what we understand, in June or July, these symptoms started to show themselves, and in a few weeks, they were at really <coughs> high levels. Over time, they continued to progress and lose leaves. These pictures are in October. But within a few weeks, they had quite fast um, defoliation and rise of, of symptoms. So the, this grower um, had a lot of experience with Christmas trees, and he'd gotten into boxwoods selling them as nursery stock. So he wasn't really used to the nursery industry, and he, he knew he could get away with a lot with boxwoods. So he went ahead and he planted these out into the field um, while they were symptomatic. So that was really why it was a tough situation um, at, at these fields, because all of these in highly infected and infested plants um, were planted out into a field situation. So eventually they went through and, and destroyed all these. But these are, these are plants that had not been transferred out in the fields, but these were what they looked like right before they were put out into the field. And even some of this, um, Propagate, these are plants propagated on site. All, all these boxwood had originally been propagated and rooted on site. It had gotten into the um, propagation beds as well. So these are rooted cuttings that have um, defoliation and dieback from boxwood blight. So these the, the plants after they went out into the field continued to defoliate. And these are plants that have no leaves on them basically at all. The worst it gets. And something to look at that's quite characteristic of the symptoms of boxwood blight, and it doesn't mean you have it, but you often get these elongated um, blackish brown cankers that, like I said, they're elongated. Now, we, that seemed really typical. Now, since we're starting to really look hard, we've, we've isolated fusarium from cankers that look similar, but this is still a very good consistent indicator. We uh, frequently find boxwood blight. This is a, a great um, alarm to send off if you see defoliation in these elongated cankers. 
Uh, more um, elongated cankers with a pretty much completely defoliated plant. You can see those right here. And you scrape off the top layer and it hasn't gone deep into the plant or anything like that. It's nice and green in the, the phloem and such, but that, that dark elongated phloem is, just seems to be fairly, not too deep, actually. So another real um, typical thing with the boxwood blight is you get the early stages, you get leaf spotting. This is a really good picture from Sharon Coleman shared with me from um, Connecticut. It's working a lot with boxwood blight. You can see these lesions here, the early stages of the leaf spot. These are pictures um, I took and what we, and it might be hard to see, it is from my angle at least, but you often have this dark elongate, um, this dark zonation around the leaf spot. And you see that here too. And these may have it too, it probably a dark zonation area. That is a help for an indicator too, but all, as you can see, all these little spots here um, at the early stages before it starts to defoliate. So then you have, um, you can see here, the spots eventually you know, progress and you get death of the leaves and then they start to fall off. Here they've completely fallen off. And these are pictures from um, Connecticut. So these um, landscape plantings, these plants were healthy. Um, at some point, the disease started, go, got itself going here. And this, this isn't under nursery conditions. Um, it's just in the landscape. It was a humid, rainy year that had a lot of warm, humid conditions for it. But it, it still, it was out in the landscape. Now, from what I understand, this was the infected plant that was put in. What they're hypothesizing was the infected plant that was put in, because it was the only plant that was put into this particular landscape planting th that year. So, um, and it just spread through these like wildfires, what it looks like here. Uh, more commercial properties. Um, with infected um, plants. It, this is all Connecticut. Pictures um, Sharon Coleman um, with the Connecticut um, Research and Experimental Station. <coughs> okay, so besides the defoliation and the leaf spots and those nice um, cankers, elongated cankers, which are good, all scream out boxwood blight. Um, you'll see, you can see, sometimes under the right conditions, you may see some white sporulation on boxwood or white-like, um, whitish. Um, the thing about boxwood blight sporulation is it forms these kind of stellate-like um, spore masses. Stellate means star-like, so it's almost like, you know, a little Christmas star, like it's projecting out like a star. Um, that's, I've, that does actually happen. That's what it looks like when it sporulates typically, but it can be mixed in with a bunch of other secondary stuff. So it, it really um, becomes, <laughs> exit? Yes, please. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No, that's bad. Oh, it is? Yeah, that eats up a lot of money. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's um, the sporulation there. And we'll look at more pictures of um, signs and symptoms here in a minute. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. Since no one from North Carolina is here, where did this guy, let's talk about them, where did this guy get the, this new the Christmas tree turned boxwood grower? Where did, where did he get his boxwood from? The question was this Christmas tree grower, where did he get it from? And um, we'll talk about that just really briefly. Now, I didn't go into the whole story, but there were two neighbors and one of the, who both um, grow boxwoods. One propagated them and sold it to the Christmas tree guy who has been growing boxwoods in the field. So he was the one who grew that. But I wouldn't even begin to try to trace it and say that there was some line because it's been found in 10 states. All those can't be traced back. So I don't think we can really 
try to even guess what happened. It seems, you know, that's, that might be one situation, a microcosm of a hundred going on. I think that that probably happened and we don't really understand what happened. Um, Were weather conditions similar in all of those places last year? I mean, was it really rainy in all of those locations? And you think that's what the question was, was the weather, was the weather situation right at all those places? Um, it could have been, I, I don't know, for, I can't say for sure, but I do know that I think we decided that they were good in Virginia, and I know that Sharon Coleman's, t and North Carolina, that, and Sharon Coleman has talked like, yes, the conditions were perfect, so I think so. Northern Ohio was wet, too. Was it wet, too? No, Northern Ohio is wet too. So hopefully it was a situation where it, the weather conditions were perfect and it was a perfect storm and this isn't going to be a yearly thing to see that. Probably it flared up to a level that everyone noticed it and hopefully, hopefully that's what, we won't be seeing this very often. So the biology, this is the spore mass, um, cylindrocladium, they have cylindrical spores. Now, the spores are um, sticky. Um, they can spread, they'll spread from plant to plant, but they also can stick to um, equipment, like, you know, you're, from you're shearing your plants. It can be spread like that fairly easily. It can stick to clothes and boots. Um, but the spores are really only for sh um, shorter distance dispersal from plant to plant or from piece of equipment to plant. They aren't going to fall off and live in the soil for a long time. But the, um, these structures will, and they're almost always, from what we've seen, produced in the plant tissue. Um, the, there are these microsclerotia. They're known in general to be a, a critical um, phase um, in the epidemiology of most cylindrocladium species. And we were not sure if the boxwood blight pathogen actually produced them at first because there were some reports in the literature that they had never been seen in plant tissue. So, um, and another thing to keep in mind is this has never, is not a root rot issue. It's always a foliar issue from what's been observed so far. It's not known to affect the roots. That's not saying it never does, but so far from what anyone known knows and has observed, it does not affect or infect the roots. So our first, um, we were concerned about all the leaf litter in these fields um, for future boxwood production. So we took and st um, stained and cleared a lot of, um, in total, hundreds of um, sections of leaf, and they were quite heavily colonized with microsclerotia. Um, both, and we infected ones in the lab too to show that you, it was actually this pathogen doing it. So they do, this pathogen does produce microsclerotia at fairly high levels. Um, and th this is showing this field. Um, af this is at, at one point, and then the <clears throat> erosion and wind is blowing and burying these leaves, mostly erosion. So we have a bad situation on some of these sites where it could be around for quite some time. And there'll, there'll be a take home ma message for all this. Um, <clears throat> So this is the proposed soil phase of the disease, which is basically what all cylindrocladium species do. They pr um, produce microsclerotia and leaf tissue. Um, they'll fall to the ground, um, and they b eventually become incorporated into the soil. Under the right conditions, these microsclerotia sporulate and inf infect the um, tissue of plants, susceptible host plants. This is actually a picture of a leaf embedded with tons of microsclerotia, and these are the spores. So this is what it does. So it's not a good thing once it becomes introduced to a site. Um, so one thing we tried in Virginia is that in the one site was to actually use an agricultural flamer and burn off the leaf litter. And we found that it was quite effective in reducing inoculum levels um, if you were able to remove the leaf litter soon after it fell to the ground and became incorporated into the soil because that's where all the microsclerotia are. So basically, we had flames before and after fields. We put um, 
sieved the soil into different fragment sizes and um, put them through a blender and plated the different fragment sizes. First thing you can see in the large fragment sizes, the leaf litter. We had a lot more leaf litter in the non-flame versus the flame. So basically what we're doing is we're flaming the leaf material. It's not anything too special, but we're getting rid of the leaf material. Um, and this is what the leaf material looks like that it wasn't got, that was not burned. It's sporulating like crazy after about three days with cylindrocladium pseudonaviculatium or buxicola, whichever you want to call it. The box would blight pathogen. Um, so we found that the colony forming units per 10 grams of soil were greatly reduced when um, you flamed the soil. Now if you flame the soil a year or two years or three years after, it's, they probably all degraded and they probably trickled down into the soil. So it's probably important to do it very soon after you find it at a site. So these are showing the different soil um, factions here, um, fractions here. Um, the larger particle sizes, which basically organic pieces of material, these are, this is where all the pathogen was found. It, not much of it had broken down into the smaller fragment sizes. <clears throat> so flaming is an effective method if you do it soon enough. So real brief summary of the disease cycle. In general, the pathogen spreads during warm, humid conditions. The, the figure that's thrown out there in most of the pest alerts is 64 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. This is when it seems to be most active in culture. So it's when we're guessing it does best um, out in the field as well. Natural host range, boxwood family. It really doesn't seem to affect anything else. So that's really all you have to be worried about and mostly the boxwoods and sarcococca or sarcococca, whichever you say. Um, Pachysandra, it's only been infected in the lab, but it's something you need to keep an eye on as well. Spread between plants and within fields by the spores um, on shorter distances. But when you have infected plants filled with these microsclerotia, it can be in the soil, it can be embedded in the plants, you might not even see sporulation, but the pathogen can be there. So really what your main concern has to be at this point, or the main strategy that makes the most sense, I think, is to try to keep it out, keep it from coming into your site. So keep the long distance travel on infected or asymptomatic plants that could be infested with microsclerotia in the soil. Um, out of your sight. Um, so this could even include soil and muddy tools if you go visit another nursery or so on and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about lookalikes really quick to develop our scouting and diagnostic skills. This really doesn't look too much like boxwood blight, but um, root um, nematodes are uh, quite an issue, can be quite an issue in some areas of the south. I know in Virginia for boxwood um, production. These are stunted plants. Obviously this isn't very much like boxwood blight, but it's one thing you can see on boxwoods. And these are lesion nematodes where the crown has been killed basically because the roots have been um, destroyed. Um, so here one thing to take to notice is you have all your foliage on. It's a straw color. It hasn't fallen off yet. It seems like with the boxwood blight pathogen that um, the host responds to, to, to the pathogen and it drops its leaves. So there, that's one thing to, to look at. You don't, nematode damage, we haven't lost any leaf material. We have stunting or we have an entirely dead plant. There's other things that can do that too, but we'll look into that. Macrophoma is another fungal issue. Um, again, a lot of times it won't defoliate. It can defoliate more than other things, but, and eventually it will defoliate, but at the early stages it won't defoliate as fast as boxwood blight in general. And you, uh, you can see these little dark um, fruiting bodies. That's um, macrophoma fruiting bodies. Very typical um, secondary and potentially a primary pathogen, but it'll come in on uh, just about anything that has, that gets a wound, you may see macrophoma on. But it supposedly can also act as a primary pathogen. 
Okay, in comparison, we see this boxwood blight plant. Oh, it's lost a bunch of its foliage. And uh, we look and we don't see any of these um, dark spots. We just see these little, um, these little dark circles. And if we did, we're lucky enough to see sporulation. Not lucky enough, but fortunate, I don't know. But if we did get to see sporulation, it would be the stellate and it wouldn't look anything like these dark guys. Not to say, when you do get it, you can't have two things on it because uh, it can be a mess diagnosing these things. But these are just some general pointers to help you out. Volutella, again, um, here on the left, Volutella, the most common thing you'll ever see on boxwood. If you take any boxwood plant and you clip its leaves, you wait a few weeks, it'll have Volutella growing on it. I think it might be an endophyte that's always there, but it is always associated with boxwood. Um, so it, you're going to see a lot of it if you start scouting heavily at some point in time. These are, have Volutella associated with the leaves. They haven't lost the leaves yet compared to the boxwood blight infected plants. If you look, this is pretty typical of, of one stage of sporulation of Volutella and it's this dried, crusty, orange, yellowish looking type of stuff. It's the, sporula it's the sporulation of the fungus. And this is, you can see it fresh where it'll look more like this. A lot of the times you end up seeing it when it's dried out at that stage. Um, okay, so, so far we've talked about the disease in general, how to, how to compare it to other types of um, potential causes of um, defoliation or symptomatic blighted material in the field. Now we're going to talk about best management practices and the best thing for best management practices at this point is um, exclusion. But we'll cover these other things as well because even if you think you have excluded it, if some, by some horrible chance, if it does inadvertently get into your site and you don't recognize it for a while, these things will help keep it in check, theoretically, and they, they will, hopefully. Um, oh, and if you're into, um, <coughs> Anagrams, rights or wrists are two good things to remember all these by, but I don't think we need to remember all of them so using an anagram. But anyway, so we'll start with exclusion for producers. So if you are a producer and you don't bring in material, this is only if you produce all your stuff. It doesn't apply to if you have to bring in material because obviously if you sell retail and you don't produce your own stuff, you're going to have to bring in things it's somewhere along the line. But if you produce all your own stuff and propagate rooted cuttings, you have to use mother plants. It's best to use mother plants, if you can, that have been in your possession for several years and have been on your site and that are obviously asymptomatic. You limit access to the mother plants, keep them at a, a corner of your nursery. If they're in the ground, try to keep the flow of traffic of workers away from them. Um, monitor mother plants, constantly scout for them, look for the symptoms we've talked about for defoliation, early leaf spots, and those elongated cankers. Don't ever, don't use um, fungicides on mother plants. You don't want to mask any low levels of symptoms. You want to have the healthiest, best um, cuttings. And it's worth hooking up the drip irrigation to the mother plants because you don't want to cause any potential extra, um, <clears throat> any conditions that could favor disease development on mother plants. These are the plants obviously we're taking cuttings from to, um, to create our rooted cuttings. So <clears throat> benefits of this, well, it's the safest. It makes record keeping easy because you're getting everything from on site. If any regulator wants to come and say, what should I, where'd you get these? Well, I got them from on site and here's my paperwork. Um, and the disadvantages, well, obviously, Everyone wants to be trying new cultivars all the time and stuff like that. You're going to be limited to what you have, but such is life. Um, so exclusion um, when you're at a retail setting, it's a little different, obviously. Um, 
we're buying okay so this is something everyone's going to wonder about you buy from suppliers who have entered the boxwood blight cleanliness agreement now i don't know have you have any of you heard of the boxwood blight cleanliness agreement it was put together by the national plant board and it's being implemented by most department of agriculture i know virginia is i know that um Pencil, I know just about any state that's had an issue with boxwood blight is, adapt, is adapting these practices. And it's basically a voluntary agreement that they sign and they say they're going to do all these best management practices we're talking about. And it just adds insurance um, for buyers so they can know they're buying from someone who's aware of it and trying to control this issue the best they can. Um, it's completely voluntary, but as you can see, one thing, basically I'm going through this agreement and talking about things that are in it. One of the main points in it is buy from people who are in this program. So if we get everyone wanting to buy from this program and be part of it, I think it'll be beneficial to be part of this. And it's supported by the American, it's been put together by the Amer American Nursery and Landscape Association, the National Plant Board, and APHIS and State Department of Agriculture have participated in it too. So it is a good, good um, program. And I'm sure you can find out from the Department of Agriculture about it. Um, okay, so create isolation area for new plants. If buy, only buy plants if you're a retail place that have entered into this. Create an isolation area for your new plant materials and separate them from other material that is non-host by at least a three um, meter area. Now three meters, why three meters? It's because that's what they're using in this regulatory framework to, um, so say if you had a detection, they would destroy all plants that were in a contiguous area that were not separated by three meters. So you'd want, you want to break up your new stock by three meters. Um, now, new host, non-host material won't be destroyed. So this is really only for the boxwood issue though. So if you have new material that's um, non-host material that happens to be setting next to it, that wouldn't be, this is only boxwood material that's being regulated and potentially um, eradicated. So sweep up and keep free of host debris weekly. Um, in the location where all host material is held. Um, okay, create an isolation area that is swept and kept free where all um, plant material is held for 30 days, where the shipments are unloaded. This is where you have all of your traffic coming in and out um, and where all of your incoming hosts are inspected before um, they leave the truck. So, or as, as or before they leave the truck, inspect them. I've heard this come up a few times today with the scale insects as well. That's a, a great idea to look at your material and either send it back or reject it or quarantine it and deal with it later as soon as you can. Um, and it's a good idea not to apply a fungicide in this area where that you're monitoring, trying to see if, make sure this stuff is healthy because a lot of times the stuff coming in will have been treated, could potentially have been treated with fungicides, um, not necessarily to mask anything, just because it's a general practice to try to reduce inoculum levels and apply fungicides to things. And if you, you, you don't want stuff that's where the symptoms are masked and it, it could show up later, obviously. So this is kind of a schematic of what we talked about. You have all of your stuff that's on display in containers and that you're showing off here. But then you have this little area where you're holding your, um, and this is only for boxwood blight hosts, boxwoods. And you have all your stuff here. This is where the shipments are coming in and out. Um, this is where all your um, fresh stuff is coming in and you're shipping out um, anything that's asymptomatic and rejecting it. And this is where all this stuff's being held. And after it's gone through this isolation period and it's approved, you can take it into your, um, the, your clean area where all the plants are stored um, or where you go on to move it up to larger size things or where you go to propagate with it or this could be a showroom it could be a 
propagation area. It could be where you're just growing plants in the field to grow them up into larger size. It's just a conceptual thing to, you know, get your plants in a, um, make sure you hold them and if you're going to go that route. Um, so then another important aspect of this, and this is from not me making this up, this is what some nurseries have done um, that I've worked with, is they're saying landscaping um, and retail sales. So this could be a retail sale, but for, I'm, I was kind of thinking this would be where you're growing your stock that you're going to sell and it's in or, or you're propagating things in this area. Now, your retail sales and people who are coming in to buy plants, you want to limit their traffic into this area. For example, we have a nursery that won't let landscapers or anyone back into their production hoop houses anymore to look at. Uh, they, it, with their own vehicles. They can go back there, they'll take them in their own golf carts and stuff. They just won't let them back in their own vehicles because they can be tracking stuff in um, on their vehicles or they might have some plant debris back there or they might have a sick plant or something. So they've just done away with that. Um, and, and the concern, this came about because of boxwood blight. So this here is a, another added la layer of protection. So I don't think I quite went over this as well uh, as I presented it, but yeah, this is the stuff's coming in, making sure it's clean. You have your clean stuff here and you're also limiting flow from people who may have exposure to symptomatic plants and other plant debris. Okay, so know the signs and symptoms of boxwood blight and scout frequently. We've gone over the signs and symptoms. Keep um, always records, records, everyone's pushing records. It's important to have some sort of system to know where your plant material comes from. Okay, so now we're looking at water management. Avoid um, overhead watering when practical and conduct watering so as to reduce leaf wetness periods. In the, um, they had written in this, um, this plan to um, allow leaves and host plants to dry before nightfall. But I mean sometimes if you're having dew condensation at night it doesn't necessarily make sense to water. Um, right before nightfall when dew is going to form on them anyway because you're just, the whole goal is to reduce leaf wetness period. You can leave that to people to figure out what the best strategy for that is. is um, monitor host plants for um, debris. Oh, monitor for host plant debris. So basically, you want to make sure with the leaf material and the from when you shear plants or anything that's fallen off isn't running off during weather events and isn't um, or during irrigation events into other boxwood production areas and so on and so forth. Basically, general management of water runoff. Um, minimize water runoff so it doesn't go from one area to the other. And always it's a good idea to minimize standing water um, in all plant blocks. It's just a great practice because, I mean, that's what we're here talking about is best management practices, integrated pest management. It's not always running after this issue or that issue. It's a good general practice not to have standing pools of water where you're storing blocks of plants because that, it's a great situation for Phytophthorus, for example. Okay, so sanitation, this is all stuff from this work plan, clean um, equipment, tools, and boots. Now, cleaning equipment, tools, and boots, it, has, it can't have dirt all over it anyway. You first need to get all the dirt off of it so these different sanitizers can function, um, such as ethanol, bleach, or ammonia. And clean leaf and host debris as regular as possible. And this has been talked about earlier today as well. Um, but the key really to this, I think, is having a surface that you can easily clean. If you have all your plants on a surface that's going to, all the debris is going to become buried and incorporated into in the first place, it's going to be almost impossible to follow this best management practice. So for example, um, now this, obviously these are not boxwoods. This was a series of slides put together for managing best management practices to manage Phytophthora remorum with 
rhododendron plants, but the same principle applies here. Basically, um, you have um, leaf debris on bare ground, um, not, not so good. Um, sometimes folks talk about putting them up on pallets over um, bare ground. Not so good, maybe a little better, but not so good because all the leaves get tangled up all in here anyway and you can still get splash up there and it's a disaster to try to clean up. Maybe a little better, but still not very good. Your leaves are still getting in this. The, the mulch is rotting. It's becoming <laughs> soil in a few years anyway. Um, this is a little better, but you know you don't have the soil, the water percolating down as well, and you're probably going to get standing pools anyway. So obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but you yeah, know you have your gravel, and and this is places where you're storing your high-value plants, and you can invest or hopefully you can invest in doing something like this. It makes sense to. Okay, so if you, last slide I believe. Yes, last slide. If you get boxwood blight, destroy the blocks with the infected plant material. At this point, I think the general feeling of the industry is that they were in eradication mode and it's not a disease. We really have fungicides registered to control it fo the foliar stage of it and that's really something we're trying to keep under check and out of the industry um, and have your pl plants grouped preemptively in three meters so by call in something that makes sense like by cultivar or by shipment that comes in or something so then if you have find it in one of these blocks just that block would have to go if regulators tell you you have to destroy them for some reason versus everything if you have everything grouped together in a contiguous thing and they aren't separated by that three meter guideline that they've set in some manual uh, or some protocol it'll be a lot easier and you'll lose a lot fewer plants if those others don't have anything and I think it's important to eradicate mycosclerotia and inoculum and host plant debris as soon as a positive is found. Do something like rake it up and get rid of it or try the soil flaming, or some, some way to reduce those inoculum levels. Oh, so that's all I had planned. Um, this is our new state seal we're trying to um, get going. This is destroy all plant diseases and it's not showing any skin there, but we'll see what we can do about that. So, any questions about the boxwood blight thing? How do you feel about rotations for those who are going to plant in the ground once they harvest? If, if there is any kind of uh, suspicious plants removed, do you think um, rotating or planting in a different area? How how far do you? I don't know. I don't know. We suggested um, our one grower really wants has been pushing to plant back in his field boxwoods and we obviously don't think that's a good idea. I think any non-host material would be great. I mean that's my personal belief. Um, it would it would it could have some risk of spreading mycosclerotia on the root balls but it would be such a low low risk and you wouldn't it's not host material. Um, especially after several years, I think that would be safe. But producing boxwoods there within 15, 20 years is kind of troublesome, I guess. But so it's a death sentence. I don't think it's a death sentence. Who knows? I mean, it's still early, and who knows? Maybe it will find it everywhere this year, and folks and regulatory agencies may have a different perspective on things. I mean, maybe it won't flare up like it did ever again for a, a while. Maybe, yeah. Are they doing anything on the genetic level with this DNA? Are they doing anything on the genetic level? Um, I, they're genotyping things. They're trying to get an idea, fingerprinting them, genetically fingerprinting them to see if they can get any idea of if there's different strains or if they came from different locations. I think everything's pretty clonal so far. There's not a, they haven't been able to tell much about them. Just nothing um, other I've heard, it's genomic. It's been around for a long time. Yeah, the, the current kind of, I think, I think most 
people working with this, plant pathologists and so on and so forth, I think it came fairly recent. I mean, within the past five or, or fewer years. Um, but there are some people who, there's um, a Boxwood expert who says he saw it um, several years ago, reported it, and no one thought anything of it. But it, I think it's pretty well accepted that it hasn't been here long and, you know, within the past five or fewer years, maybe. I don't know. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.